understand you had a fairly theological message this morning on the triunity, the trinity. Tonight is not going to be so, so theological as such. Initially it was going to be. Uh, I was originally thinking in terms of uh, Isaiah 40, and I've been bouncing around all over the place. And for some reason, the Lord seems to be laying Joshua chapter 7 on my heart. And uh, we just ask the Lord for his blessing upon his word in our time this evening. Heavenly Father, we do thank you in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that though our sins are many, your mercy is more. Where grace, where, where sin did abound, grace does much more abound. And we thank you and we praise you for that, Father. None of us could stand, none of us could be here apart from the grace, the love, the mercy of our wonderful Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, we simply look to you and ask that you would be pleased to uh, speak through us, Father. And if there's someone here this evening that specifically needs to hear that which is about to be said, Father, that you would speak uh, loudly. I know I need to continually hear these things. So we thank you, Father, for the purifying effect that the word of God has in the hearts and lives of your people and the convicting effect it has on the unsaved drawing those whom you have called to yourself, Father. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. It may seem a little strange. It's interesting that many circles that I uh, once moved in, in Brethren Assemblies, on Sunday evenings, was always the gospel meeting. Sunday morning was for the saints. Sunday evening was for the sinners. But it seemed to come to the place where there were very few sinners on the Sunday evening services, and they sort of started going by the wayside. Uh, I don't know if this message is for the saved or the unsaved. We'll let the Spirit of God decide that in each heart. But uh, the title that I've given it is simply, You've Been Lied To, Lies of the Devil. And I'm not here to glorify the devil, believe me. And I'm not here to exalt him. But I do believe that we have to be aware of his schemes. Know your enemy. It's hard to do warfare against an enemy that you don't know. And uh, I'm going to read an introduction like I usually do. And first of all, I also want to thank you for the privilege. Thank uh, Pastor Darrell and the uh, board for affording me this privilege. I always love standing here in, in this pulpit, in this place. This is a place where uh, the Lord blessed Lynn and myself. Abundantly and continues to bless me uh, anytime I have the privilege of coming. So I thank you uh, and the fellowship here for that and for the love, the kindness, the care, especially over the last few months. Uh, only eternity will tell uh, the blessing that uh, you folks have been to myself personally and to my two boys. If you have any spiritual, and I'm just reading the introduction here, but if you have any spiritual uh, muscle at all, there are things happening in our world and in our country that ought to get us angry. Homosexual marriage, abortion on demand, legalized gambling, corruption in high places, to name but a few. I could add many other things onto that, just in the events of the past few weeks, things that are going on over in, in Ukraine. Families are disintegrating all around us, not only in the world, but in the church. As I look around, I'm greatly concerned that we are being deceived. We are being lied to by the powers of darkness. Many today inside and outside the church are listening to the destructive, deceitful, malignant lies of the devil. Just as I believe in, an, in a literal Jesus Christ today, I also believe in a literal devil. As a matter of fact, I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, buying a book in the occult section in Central Station in Montreal, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. I thought I was buying a book on Satan worship. That night, I was a saved man. It was written by a Christian. 
and just simply outlining the schemes and the wiles of the devil and how he has deceived uh, a world. And he is at work uh, also uh, in the church. There is an historical account in the book of Joshua, the story of Achan. As I read of the fall of Jericho to the children of Israel, I can only conclude that Achan was listening to the lies of the devil. My purpose in this message this evening is to expose the devil and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would be my heart's desire. So if you do have your Bibles, uh, if you want to turn to Joshua chapter 7, we may be bouncing around there a little bit. It's a long chapter. But looking at verse 21, we read, and this is the account of Achan. He said, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth, in the midst of my tent, with the silver under it. See, Joshua and the children of Israel, they were commanded by God that they were not to touch any of the valuable things. Nothing. The gold, the silver, the garments, anything of value was all to go into the treasury of the Lord. All the children of Israel, the warriors, as they went into Jericho, they were given the same instruction. But then we see the uh, words here when it's being exposed that Achan has sinned. And we'll be looking at different passages, but he says, I saw the eye gate. I saw, and then I coveted. After I saw that which was forbidden, I wanted it, I desired it, I lusted after it, I coveted it. And then the next step was, I took it. Sound like the Garden of Eden to you? You see, I can hear the hiss of the serpent. You, you don't see him, but you can hear the hiss of the serpent in the background, working with Achan. I saw, I wanted, I took. Now it's hidden. What's the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they sinned? They hid. They hid. Well, you see, when you do things that are pure and righteous and holy and good, you don't have to hide. You can do it openly. You can expose it to the world. You can expose it to God's people. But when you do something that's wrong and wicked and evil, and that goes contrary to the word of God, the first thing you do is you have to hide it. You have to hide it. And so the first lie of the devil I would like to speak on tonight, briefly, is that the word of God is not always true. I'm speaking to the Lord's people here tonight. Now, I'm not saying that the word of God is not always true. This is a lie of the devil. The lie of the devil comes and the hiss of the serpent says and insinuates that the word of God is not always true. Mostly true, but not always true. In Joshua 6, verses 18 and 19, we see the command of God to the children of Israel concerning the spoils of war and the taking of Jericho. It says this, And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed thing, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron are consecrated to the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Initially, I'm pretty sure that Achan had no intentions of disobeying God's command. I, I'm pretty sure of that until something happened, until he saw. But when they went into Jericho, I'm sure that Achan intended to obey God's word. The walls of Jericho fall, and Achan finds, him, finds himself alone in some place looking at what God had forbidden. Have you ever found yourself in a place like that? Come on, I know you have. Looking at that which God has forbidden. And now you're desiring the very thing that God has forbidden. Now there's a struggle of the will going on. Do I obey God or do I follow what I want to do? 
And this is where the cross comes in in the life of a believer. Well, it's interesting, and I did, you know, I'm saying this, but I didn't get to the phone in time yesterday morning, or yesterday, I guess it was more in the afternoon. And so I, there was a message left on, and I picked it up, and all it was was a very good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, he's the one who first spoke to Lynn and I about the Lord 48 years ago. And he was sobbing, just crying. And I, actually, I, whatever you call that, FaceTimed him, and he was bawling his eyes out. I said, John, what's going on? And he finally could get out. He was preaching this morning at the, his church. And he said, I'm preaching on the cross. And he was reading a book that I gave to him many years ago simply called Born Crucified. It's about the cross. It's about uh, being identified with the crucified one. And he said, my life is so shallow. It, it's so empty in comparison to what I know the word of God tells me my life should be as I allow the Lord Jesus Christ to live his life in and through me. You see, and there's this struggle in the life of the believer. Do I do what God, I know what God wants, or do I do what my heart is running after? The cross in the life of a believer. Well, Achan is now at a crossroad. He's looking at that which God has forbidden. He's wanting what God has forbidden. And the day that you decide, as I believe the lie of the evil one came to Achan, that the word of God is not always true, Achan. I mean, after all, it's only a little bit of silver and it's only a little bit of gold and it's really just one bab. I mean, look, at there's, there's gold all over the place. There's silver. I mean, you're not going to miss that. Come on, please. And I can see him wrestling with this. But the day that you or I decide that sometimes the Bible is not true and that you can go against it, I want to guarantee you that you will live to regret that day. You will live to regret that day. Aiken lived to regret that day. Someone else who lived to regret that day was a man by the name of Adam. Eve, yea, as God said, the doubt was in. Now she's looking, now she's wanting, now she's taking, and now she will regret. And it won't be too long before she's standing at the grave site of a son because of looking and wanting and taking. And yea, as God said, God has said, and God means what he says. For in the day that you take from the tree of the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. I'm sure God didn't really mean that. I guess he did. Many of us in this room have stood at grave sites of loved ones. And yes, God really did mean that the wages of sin is death. It really is. But thank God for the cross. Thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for the hope of the gospel of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that makes sense in this world, by the way. Nothing else makes sense. Nothing. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. If you watch any good news on television lately, we have good news. <laughs> In contrast to the bad news, what a wonderful Savior we have. I'll just move down to the second line. God will make an exception in my, in my case. 
God will make an exception in my days. I mean, I, I know he means it for all these other really bad people, but for me, I mean, come on. I mean, I've done some really good things. I've been living a good life for so long, so long. And just this once, God's going to make an exception. No, severe consequences aren't, aren't for me, sure. For me, God will make an exception. I know what the Lord said. I can see Achan saying, saying, don't take any of the spoils of war. But in my case, God will make an exception. You see, my friends, you never sin until you think you can sin and get away with it. Isn't that true? I mean, Eve didn't take of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of, of good and evil until she thought she could do it and get away with it because Satan said to her, you will not surely die. Oh, oh, well, if I'm not going to die, then I can do it. You see, I can, I can do it and get away with it. God didn't really mean what he said. And in my case, he'll make an exception if he did. That's a lie of the devil. That's the hiss of the serpent. And any time these insinuations come into your heart, listen for the hiss of the serpent. And not only from the sinners, I think of, of, of Peter. And what does Jesus say to him in the garden? Or not in the garden, but after at, at Phil, uh, Phil, Philippi, Caesarea Philippi. This isn't going to happen to you, Lord. There'll be no cross for you, Lord. You don't have to suffer, Lord. Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. You see, Jesus could hear the hiss of the serpent coming through the saints. And sometimes it's the saints that the evil one uses to say to you, God will make an exception this time. I mean, he made an exception for me. I mean, I got away with it. You got away with nothing. Absolutely nothing. One thing I know about all of us is that God always gets the last word. Never forget that. God always gets the last word. Many examples in the scripture, Ahab and Jezebel, who stole Naboth's vineyard, paid a cain for Ahab and Jezebel. David sinned with Bathsheba. Well, surely I can sin and get away with it. Surely in my case, I'm the king of Israel. I'm the anointed of God. Surely I can sin and get away with it. God didn't really mean it in my case. Absalom's rebellion against his father cost him his life. He thought he could rebel against the kingdom and against his father and against God's anointed and get away with it. It cost him his life. I don't know if I should get personal here. And I don't know if I've ever used this as an illustration. I used to use it with little kids. Lynn and I used to do children's meetings all over the place, five day children's crusades and all kinds of different things and speak at camps for children. And, but when I was a little kid, nine years, 10 years old, I said my, my parents, especially my mother, never wanted me to play with guns or anything like that, BB guns. And my best friend, Kevin Grace, for his birthday, he got a BB gun. You know, one of those Red Rider jobs, you know, 50 shots and all this type of stuff. I don't know if you've ever watched that movie. I think it's called The Christmas Story, the, you know, and the neat, neat movie. The guy gets his phone stuck on the cross fence. But uh, Kevin got this BB gun and his, uh, he called me up one night and he asked me to come over to his place. And I just lived across the park from Kevin. And uh, I went over there and as I'm walking out the door, my mother says to me, she said, Russ, he says, uh, if, if Kevin's using that gun playing with he says, I want you to come home. Right. It was clear instruction. I knew exactly what she was saying. It was a command. You don't mess with Trixie O'Neill. Welsh. And I went over to Kevin's place and his mom or dad, whoever came to the door, said, oh, Kevin's downstairs in the basement. So I go downstairs in the basement and you'll never guess what Kevin was doing. Well, he had a raggedy hand doll hanging up from one of the pipes down there, and he was back about, I don't know, the other end of the basement. He's shooting at this thing, and as soon as I saw him, 
my first thought, well, I, I got to get out of here. Or else Kevin, I got to ask Kevin to put away the, the, the rifle. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, he pulls the trigger and, <laughs> and the raggedy hand all goes like that, you know. And, and so I said, well, surely if I just sit on the stairs and watch Kevin, you know, doing this and, and uh, yeah, you, you know, as long as I don't do it, but I can just sit and watch. Ooh, now I'm the eye gate. And all of a sudden I'm having a desire in me. I want to do what my mother told me not to do. Now I have to make a decision, but no, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. And, and Kevin says, he, hey, Russ, you want to try it? I said, well, no, no, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell. You know, just the two of us here. Yeah, I'm not going to tell on you. I said, "Come on, you just." Well, I guess one shot won't hurt, will it? One shot turned into fifty shots, turned into one hundred shots, and oh my goodness, well, I was having the time of my life. And Kevin, it was his turn. He's shooting, and you know, he emptied the gun fifty shots, and I'm going up, picking up babies, and doing all kinds of stuff. And I turned around, he's pointing the gun right at my head, but it's empty. You know? Through my lip, knocked out this tooth. My lip is like this, blood all over the place. Hmm. First thing in my mind, Russ, if Kevin's playing with the gun, I want you to come home. What in the world am I, how, what, what am I going to tell my mother? Well, we can talk to the story because Kevin was given strict instructions by his parents. You never point that gun at anyone. I don't care if it's loaded, empty. You never point a gun at someone. So he's in trouble. I'm in trouble. So we had to concoct the story. What was I doing? I'm trying to hide. Do you see the pattern? It's the same. It doesn't matter what the sin is. I'm a kid, 10 years old, BB guns up. But there are husbands out there and wives out there that think that they can get away with cheating on their spouse. It's happening all over the place, by the way. And it's happening in the church. I hope it's not happening in this church. Because it's the type of thing we don't advertise, do we? No, but when you do something like that, you hide it. You can't let anyone know about this because, you know, and so the story I concocted was I'm running across the field and, you know, to home and I trip and fall and hit my mouth on a rock and, you know, there we go. And so I, I go running home and I, I tripped. I just in case my mom or dad are looking out the window watching. And so I trip, I hit the, and I, oh, and, I, and I, I go home and I go crashing through the door. I start crying now. And I told the lie. And I got away with it. Six months later, well, I had to go to the dentist the next morning, but he just put some type of a temporary thing on it. But six months later, I'm back at the dentist. He's taking x-rays. He comes running out of the x-ray room and he holds this thing up in the, and there's this glowing ball in the x-ray. It looked like the sun was shining. You know, everything was black except this, this glowing ball. And he says, what in the, and he's feeling, I knew exactly what it was, but I knew it was still in there. And he says, I wonder what this is. And I'm sitting there and I'm shaking. I don't know. I went back and told Kevin, well, we got to do something about this, and I'm glad we didn't do what we did. What we thought of doing was slipping my lid open, lip open and trying to get this pop the BB out. Because if I'd done that, we wouldn't have got because all the sinews and everything had been attached to it. And I, we finally came, we finally came clean. There's a verse in the Bible that says something like, "Be sure your what is it? Sin will do what? Yes." Be sure your sin will find you out. Whether you're a 10 year old boy, a six year old boy or girl, whether you're an adult, whether you're a grandparent, God always gets the last word, always. And God means what he says. But I thank God that there is absolute forgiveness in Christ. For all the wrong we do, whether we sin in our mind, mental attitude sins are 
by far the, probably the worst, by the way. Sins of the tongue and sins of commission. That's the three ways we sin. Sins of the heart. Jesus and the Lord and the word of God never makes an exception for anyone. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that when a believer sins like this, their chastening will be much more severe. Because God disciplines, the word there disciplines is scourges, basically scourges alive, skins alive. Every son whom he loves. And you've probably sensed and felt that scourging at times in your own life as a believer. But thank God for the cross. Thank God for the blood which cleanses us from all sin. Thank God that where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Thank God for his mercy. And you don't need mercy until you've done something wrong. The third lie. You can't be content and live the Christian life. You see, Achan, he couldn't have been content with God's provision. Because if he had have been content with God's provision, he wouldn't have wanted more. And that's what covetousness is. is it? It's wanting more of what you already have enough of. Had God been supplying the children of Israel with absolutely everything they needed? Absolutely everything. But obviously, Achan was not content with God's provision. Are you content with God's provision? Be content with such things as you have, the word of God says. God wants us to be content with his provision for our lives. But I believe that Achan believed the lie of the devil. If I just had a little silver and a little gold, and if I had that clothing, everything would be fine. That's all I want. That's not asking too much, is it? They can believe the lie of the devil, which says you can't be content with God's provisions for you as a Christian. See, my friends, when you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. It's taken me a while in the past several months to actually lay hold of that and believe it. Though I preached it for many years, Jesus is all you need. I believe it. I preached it. I still believe it today, but I struggled with it. And I don't know if it was the devil coming to me, but it, it was coming to me with truth. It came to me with the word of God. If Jesus is all I need, and even if I lost everyone who was near and dear to me and all of my valued possessions, and I lost absolutely everything in this life, but had Jesus, that's all I need. Just me and Jesus. Then my mind goes back to the Garden of Eden. And my mind went back to the Garden of Eden and there was Adam and Jesus. And it was only the two of them. It was only the two of them. The Lord and Adam walking in the cool of the day. The Lord giving Adam jobs to do and giving him the ability to do those jobs and to do them excellent and, and being rewarded. And, and it was wonderful, the incredible harmony and love and fellowship and Jesus was all Adam needed, right? Then why? Did the Lord say, it is not good for man to dwell alone? Well, I've wrestled with that one. But Jesus is all we need. He really is. But we have so many other things and people and and these are wonderful gifts of God's grace, or, but everything he has given to us is a gift, and it's only temporary. It's only temporary. 
And he has the ability, not only the ability, the right to give and to take away. Not to hurt, but to draw us closer to himself, to crowd us to him so that we will abandon ourselves to him and to him alone. And as a weak and frail and empty and broken human being, that's hard at times. And you know that. But it's real. And his promises are true. His promises are absolutely true. The fourth lie of the devil. Your sin is your business. Many, just, many say today, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Problem with that statement is that you don't have a life. You don't have a life. Life belongs to God. Your life is not your life. It's God's life. Every breath you have is a gift from God. And he can take it at any moment he wants. And he will, because it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And it's our lives are in his hands. It's his life. His life in you. His life in me. Anyone here chose to be born? Who here chose to be born and brought into this world? Who here chose the color of their skin? The color of their eyes, the color of their hair. Who here chose the country you were born in? Who here chose you? Did you choose your parents? You, you, you had no say in this. Neither did I. But God gave life. And he breathed into you the breath of life. It's his life. It's all his it's wonderful. It's glorious. Life is a gift from God. It belongs to him. And he can recall it at any time. I'm sure Aiken thought to himself, it'll be fine. I'm not going to affect anyone else. I mean, if I sin, it's not, it's not going to affect anyone else. It's, it's me. It's my sin. My sin is my business. And okay, even if I have to suffer a few consequences, but it's not going to affect anyone else. My sin is my business. People think that in the church, you know. They think that their sin, because it's private or, or whatever, that no one else knows about it, that it's not going to affect the rest of the body. I want to assure you, my friends, it will affect the whole body, even if no one else knows about it. And so I want us to just look at a few of the devastating consequences of Achan's sin. First of all, the consequences it had on the entire nation of Israel. They could defeat the mighty city of Jericho, but the insignificant city of Ai, just a little, what would you call it? A little suburb, basically, of, uh, of Jericho. And you know what happened. You'll, you could find this the story, the history of it in uh, Joshua 7, uh, starting at verse 10. It says, so the Lord said to Joshua, oh, this was after the defeat, and God is telling, to Josh, telling Joshua uh, what had happened and why it happened. He said, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? You see, when the children of Israel were defeated at Ai, Joshua goes into his tent and he falls on his face before he said, what in the world is going on? We, we were just defeated by this small, insignificant nothing. God says, get up off your face. There's sin in the camp. And that sin in the camp has to be dealt with and it has to be removed. This individual, and God could have told Joshua who it was, but he doesn't. He, he, he parades a whole Basically, nation of Israel, tribe by tribe, family by family, person by person. And this is being done in front of the whole congregation. And his sin is going to be exposed to the place where Achan will finally say, okay, I did it. I, 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 I 
I, I saw, I wanted, I took, and I hid. And here's where I hid it. And he's discovered. God said that if they didn't get rid of that cursed thing, that God would no longer be with them. God would no longer be there uh, to protect them, to watch over them. They had to make a decision. They had to get rid of the sin, the accursed thing. They had to make a choice between the sin and God. You see, God's love does not embrace what God's justice condemns. And somehow, some way, we in the church, in the modern day North American church, somehow we think that, that God's grace and, and love embraces that which his justice and holiness condemns. It's not true. It's a lie of the devil. I mean, how in the moral aspect of things in the so-called church, I call it Christendom, I actually call it a monstrosity what's going on today. The things that they are embracing, things that 25 years ago the world rejected, the church is bringing in. How does that happen? Because of the malignant, deceitful lies of the devil. But thank God for the churches and the people that stand for the truths of the word of God. Every word of it is true. Yea, God has said. Period. Period. So there was consequences for the children of Israel, and there was consequences for 36 soldiers that died at Ai. And those 36 soldiers would have been connected to 36 families, wives, children, cousins, aunts, uncles, and one death as an expansion of 30, 40, 50 other people that go into an incredible state of mourning and grief because their loved one is now dead. And why is their loved one dead? Because of vacant sin. That's why they're dead. And so this one man's sin had a consequence upon the entire nation and has a consequence upon 36 soldiers and all their families. It also had a very serious consequence upon Achan's wife. She is going to be stoned as well. It has a consequence upon Achan's children. And fathers, hear this. Your sin affects your whole family. Whether no one in your family knows. I don't know if Achan's wife and his children knew that that stuff was hidden in the tent. I have no idea. The scripture doesn't say. But his sin affected his whole family. It destroyed the family. My sin, before I knew the Lord, destroyed my family. Thank God for his mercy because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And I thank God he gave me my family back. He didn't have to do that. But I know many people whose sin has destroyed their families. You know people like that too. You see, Aiken's sin was not simply his business, it was everybody's business. You see, my friends, if you fall, it hurts me. If I fall, it hurts you. It hurts the entire body. It brings shame to the body of Christ. It affects everybody. That one simple act of looking Wanting, taking, trying to hide. God gets the last word, it's exposed, and shame comes upon the body of Christ. Because we're all members of one body. And what one member does affects the whole body. And then fifthly, there isn't a judgment day. There's no judgment day. Aiken thought he could sit and get away with it. And even if he was caught, there wouldn't really be any serious consequences. He had to have think thoughts like that to have done what he had did. 
I don't know if that's good English or not. He's done what he did, but anyway, I think we know what I'm saying. He believed the lie of the devil, and there are consequences for sin. And we read in Joshua 22, I won't read the whole thing, maybe starting around verse 25, and Joshua said, what would, why had, Joshua tell, says to Joshua, says to Achan, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned him with fire after they had stoned him with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones still to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the place is called the Valley of Achor to this day. That's the Valley of Trouble. The Valley of Achor. I've known a lot of the Lord's people have been brought to the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble. And it's their sin that brought them there. You could see and find many examples as well from the scriptures. And it talks about that heap and pile of stones. What a memorial. What a reminder. What a, a, an object lesson. This pile of stones. And it's interesting that in, amongst the people of Israel, there was no one said, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll take Achan's place. Here, here, stone me instead of Achan. No one took Achan's place. But we have a savior who left heaven 2,000 years ago. And where there should be a pile of stones on top of me, Jesus came and said, I'll take your place. I'll take your place. I'll take that look and that desire and that want and that trying and, and taking and hiding. He said, I'll take it all upon me because I love you. I don't care how deep the sin is, my love and my grace and my mercy will go so far deeper and raise you up out of that heap, and I will give you life and life more abundantly so that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So that you can go and warn people, don't listen to the lies of the devil, but listen to the promises of the word of God. The promises of God's word. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony that they loved not their life unto the death. What a message we have. And if now there's someone here and you're listening to the hiss of the serpent, be done with it, my friend. Turn your back on it and embrace the cross. Exercise your will in accordance with the will of God, depending upon his strength, his power, the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit. You can't fight the devil in the energy of the flesh. You can't fight Goliath with Saul's armor. You have to go with the sling that God has provided and that stone, that rock that God has provided. You have to go by faith, by faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Achan, unfortunately, was not diligently seeking God. People say to me, I don't believe in hell. I look at them, I say, well, you can go to hell without believing in it. Because that's where you're headed. I said, you'll be there for for five seconds and you'll believe in nothing else other than hell. You'll never get out. That's a doctrine that's under question today, by the way. Yea, has God said. Surely God doesn't really mean a, a literal hell. Do you hear the hiss of the serpent? Churches are falling like flies. Theologians, so-called, are falling like flies, and they're propagating these vicious, malicious lies and deception of, that are wired to the very pit of hell. You say, Russ, that's a little harsh. Not harsh enough, my friends. Not harsh enough. I love what Spurgeon said. He said, whenever the devil is attacking one area of the Christian church or doctrine, he said, the church of Jesus Christ should rise up and double, quadruple, and do whatever they can and expose that law and teach that truth louder and stronger than ever. 
but it's offensive. Of course it's offensive. The cross was offensive, still is. That the, I was going to say the privilege, it wasn't a privilege at all, it was frightening. I was speaking to people who were literally a breath away from hell, laughing and mocking me. They weren't mocking me at all, they were mocking God, they were mocking his word, they had listened to the lies of the devil. And in less than 24 hours, a healthy young man is dead. And I told him, as I looked at him, I said, John, I said, people die on those things. It was a motorcycle. I said, I've been up to the cemetery there and there are, I've looked on those grave markers and there are people there who are younger than you. The very next day, that man was dead, splattered all over the road. He was a breath away. I didn't know this would be his last opportunity. The Lord knew. See, the gospel is serious, my friends. And then the last one, and I'm done, though I don't think I'll ever be done. Ah, you have plenty of time. You got plenty of time. You have plenty of time to repent. You have plenty of time to get things right. You have plenty of time to serve the Lord. But not right now. I've got plenty of time. The, the thing that's problem with that is that those who are planning to repent tomorrow usually die today. You see, they think that they can repent anytime they want. But repentance as well is a gift from God. It is the goodness of God that leads a person to repentance. And you do not choose when you're going to repent or when you're not going to repent. That's not your choice. Repentance is given to you. Faith is given to you. And if you think that you can choose when you're going to repent, my friends, that's not the way it works. That's not the way God works. God commands all people everywhere to repent. It's not a suggestion. He commands all people everywhere to repent, and those who do not repent will suffer the consequences. And the hiss of the serpent comes in, oh, you've got plenty of time. You can serve the Lord later. You can come to the Lord later. You've got plenty of time. You don't know how much time you have. And I was with my dad. He was having the time of his life. Mountain View, New York, July the 12th, 1970, up on the dance floor. I was with this young lady and I looked at her and I said, he'll be asking you next. Dad loves to dance. No warning. No one came to him that morning and said, Harry O'Neill, get your house in order. You're doing up your shoelaces now, but the undertaker is undoing them tonight. And he was gone. No warning. That affected me. That affected me for the next four years. It was the goodness of God allowing me to watch that, to watch for the first time in my life, someone whom I love literally drop dead in front of my eyes, who was full of life. I thought, he thought. Have you repented? Are you living your life to please God? Is Jesus all you need? Is the Christian life more important to you than the very breath that you breathe? Because the Christian life is the breath that you breathe because it is his life in and through you. Verse I always quote, you're very familiar with, I think it's up on the board somewhere around here, right there. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. It's his life. For me to live is what? Christ. To die is gain. Oh, that that would be true in my life. I don't know if it's true or not. I want it to be true. 
I understand what it's saying. And I also understand that I don't think the way I used to think before I was saved. I don't do the things I used to do. It's not, it's not that I set out, I set out, well, okay, I can't do this. Can't. There's none of that anymore. That was religion. It's, it's these, this, there's just been this invasion of, of new thoughts and new desires and new wants. How'd that happen with the Spirit of God? Only the Spirit of God in the heart and life of a believer. You see, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And so in closing, I would say, if you have an habitual sin, you need to get rid of it today. You say, Russ, now you're meddling. I haven't got a clue if you have habitual sins or not. The Spirit of God does. I want to assure you of that. And God always gets the last word. Achan found that out. As a matter of fact, you see right through the scriptures, right through history, right through my life. <laughs> you need to confess it today. If you have an attitude problem, get rid of it today. A lot of churches, a lot of people have a lot of attitude problems. Churches are falling apart, by the way, all over the place. Attitude problems. I'm trying to help out a little church now, and oh my goodness, attitude problems. How many splits can a church go through in a year and a half, two year period? Attitude problems. From the leadership down. That's serious. This is a church of a living God. My attitude, my opinion doesn't mean a thing. My agenda means nothing. This is the only agenda that counts. Nothing else. It's his church. He is to have the preeminence. He is the head of the body of the church. No one else. I hope it's not true, but I was supposed to give these out anyway. That's an outline. Um, because you're saying, I hope that this isn't the case, but there may be someone or some here this evening. You're just a step away from making a very bad decision. And you think you can get away with it. Don't do it. Make the adjustment now. Fall on your face before the Lord. He searches the heart. He knows you better than you know yourself. He means what he says, and he offers you grace. He offers you his power, his strength, his life. You don't have to do what you think you have to do. That's how much he loves you. And Father, we sit here, stand here, thanking you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we thank you, Lord, that you were willing to step in and, and take our sin and in a sense have that pile of rocks thrown at you, shedding your own precious blood for the forgiveness of our sin. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.